Hi friends, my name is Angela and welcome back to my channel and welcome to the end of July. July was a busy month and welcome to all the new subscribers. There's, it was a bit of a busy month on YouTube, so welcome to all of you who have newly subscribed. Thanks for being here. I'm glad you're here. Every month I do a little bit of a wrap up of my month. I share a bit about what my month was like and then I'll share a bit about the books that I read. I like doing these check-ins but I think they might get a bit looser because I really did enjoy doing that dedicated book review earlier this month and you guys seem to enjoy like bookish chats and real specific chats about topics and books. So these, I don't know, we'll see where these go in the future, but for today, we're going to wrap up July and I'll share the books that I read this month. We have just four weeks left of winter in Australia and the daffodils are starting to appear. My new, my brand new quince tree that we planted in July is starting to flower and I've been eating tangerines, clementines and mandarins every day. I just love eating them when they're really in season. I definitely feel like this month I've been locked inside a lot more than the previous months because the weather has been so awful. A lot of rain, very, very cold, but I'm okay with that because that has led to a lot of cozy mysteries that I've been reading and I've picked up a few knitting projects as well, which has kind of led to listening to cozy mysteries on audiobook while knitting, which has not been a problem in my book at all. The other major development was that my husband and I just locked in our next major holiday next year, which will be in March, and it's going to be a winter holiday, and I hope to bring you along on that. And of course, I've started curating my TBR for this exotic, beautiful location that I can't wait to go back to. But late July is usually the time when I start to think about spring and summer. It's a bit of a gardener's curse because you really do need to think about what you want to do now in order to achieve the summer that you want to have. It's a bit like that old adage of summer bodies are made in winter. You need to start doing things now to get what you want later. Um, you know, what vegetables do I want to be growing, especially because I grow a lot of things from seed? What flowers do I want? What do I want my garden to look like in summer? What do I want it to feel like? And then I also start to think about what my summer holidays might be looking like, which then leads me to what my summer reading list is going to look like. And because our summer holidays are over Christmas, it is an especially busy period, but we have a lot of time off. You know, generally there's a, a few weeks off work and there's a lot of long weekends that come up. So there's a lot of breaks, there's a lot of downtime. It's a really fun time. I really, it's a, it's a great time of year. But so while I'm doing that, thinking forward, I'm trying to really live in the moment and appreciate the last days of winter. And it can be really hard when you're jumping on social media and watching people in the Northern Hemisphere having barbecues and days at the beach. And so I'm trying very hard to just live in the moment, enjoy where I am right now and let this season lead me where I am rather than push myself too soon into those spring days. So as I mentioned, a large part of my July was thinking about my TBR coming up into spring and summer. And when I shared a video this month about slow reading, I shared that I've got some big books that I really want to get to, but I'm daunted by them because I know that they're going to take time. They're not a book that I'm going to finish in a week. So I've decided that moving forward, I'm going to do a little bit of a prescribed reading list every quarter. And what that is going to look like is I'm going to be choosing some of those classics, some of those books that I really want to get to, those books that I think are going to improve my education, my knowledge, my vocabulary, those books that are really going to be milestones for me. And, you know, those, those are the, the big ones, you know, like Moby Dick and some Jane Austens and some Brontes. But then there are more, more modern classics like, I don't know, Colleen McCullough, um, A.B. Facey. There's a lot of Australian ones that are just really daunting that I would love to get to. Les Miserables, it's not Australian obviously, but these, these are the sort of things, these milestone books that I would love to get to. So I'm gonna start prescribing some of these things on a quarterly basis. And with that, I'm also going to leave space for the mood books. Those books that you want to just pick up, maybe something that I see in a bookstore and I think that looks like a bit of fun. That Maybe that's something that I can finish in a weekend um, over, a, you know, a summer weekend or whatever it might be. Something that you want that's a bit of a lighter read. Just something that tickles your fancy here and there. So I'm going to try and do a bit of a mix and I'm going to share those TBRs with you and we'll see, we'll see where it takes us. But ultimately, I just hope it helps me reach some goals and helps me read those books or at least get started reading the books 
so I can at least say, well, I tried and I didn't like it or I did like it because at the moment I haven't tried and I just, I need to get it, I need to get to it. So that's kind of where I've been, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that stuff this month. And speaking about TBRs, um, which kind of leads me into book lists, right? You find these lists on the internet of books that you should read. And the New York Times book list, of course, that came out over last month was a big one. It was a big topic on the internet, not just in BookTube or YouTube. And I, I read it, I had a look at it, and I was, I was disappointed, like a lot of Australians, I think, because it was very American, which I think it tracks because it's from the New York Times. I wasn't expecting them to have a lot of Australian books on there. But I think these pop cultural moments are a little bit, it's important not to take these things to heart, right? It's, these are some people's opinions. I remember someone shared a, a number of uh, novelists or authors or celebrities, whatever, were asked to share their top 10 books over the last 25 years. And some authors shared their own book, you know, so these are still publicity tools for them. So it's still a little bit of, take it with a grain of salt. But it's led to some really interesting conversations. There are some bookstores in Australia, some independent booksellers that have started their own um, top lists of, you know, the, the, the best books of the last 25 years, which has been interesting. And I, I really enjoyed seeing them because it's allowed me to, it's done the legwork to help me um, think about those more modern and contemporary books that maybe I should be looking towards. And if anything, all these lists have really helped me realise that it's not so much maybe a specific book, but there are some authors that I haven't read yet that I really need to. I really need to read Zadie Smith, uh, Jessamyn Ward, Toni Morrison, Joan Didion, Hilary Mantel, Ali Smith. These are authors that I haven't read yet. And I really love that they're all women. I, th and these are some, I think, novelists that I would really love to get to uh, in the near future. And it did kind of lead me down a bit of a rabbit hole, which took me to Barack Obama's summer reading list, which I always love. I think his summer reading lists are really quite thoughtful. Again, they're very American. There's always a lot of political and cultural moments on there, but I think they're really quite poignant at times. So, and I, I believe his 2024 reading list is coming out soon. So I'm going to keep an eye out for that. But there's always a few interesting ones that come off his reading list. But this whole concept of the best books of all time or the best books of the last 25 years, it really got me thinking about what are the best Australian books that I should be looking towards? What are the, you know, like, um, I, I like to read to further my own education as well as my own. I want to be a better person because I read. That's something I like to get out of my reading. And I realized something, something that's come out of having to talk about books is how much, how little I know about certain things. So I realized that I really want to know a little bit more about my country, about Australia. I want to know more about the historical figures in my country, about the people who founded this country, um, the people that came here, the people that were here. And I, this is kind of where my thoughts have gone over the last month. I mean, I have a book about Alexander Hamilton on my bookshelf, but I don't, I could not, I don't have one about someone who would be considered a founding father of Australia on my bookshelf, or at least I didn't until last week. So that's kind of where I'm going with this is I want to know more. I want to know more about the history of Australia. I want to be educated better. I want to hold these conversations. So I've added some hefty books to my reading list this summer. Some are, I'm excited to get to and I'm excited to share them with you and I think you guys are going to love them. There are some Australian historical figures. There are some books that are significant pieces of Australian literature. And I think a bunch of you are going to love it because a lot of you are asking me for recommendations on books to tell you more about Australia's history or books that are just, you know, significant pieces of Australian literature. And uh, I, I want to know more too. So we're going to go on this learning journey together. So that's kind of, this is where all my thoughts have been over the last month. But uh, yeah, it's been fun. Okay, let's get into some books. I'm going to start off with perhaps the worst book I've read this year. The Trackers by Charles, I'm going to say Fraser. If it's Frazier, please tell me, but I really don't care at this point. This was the worst book I've read. It's, 
not even the writing is really good it was the story was just not there for me at all and i was so disappointed because i was really excited for this one it just didn't do it for me on so many levels i think the first part was that there was no quotation marks for dialogue which just rubbed me the wrong way to start with it made it very hard at, at one point to follow but it was just the tip of the iceberg so the story with this particular book is we follow a man named val who is an artist and we're in depression era Wyoming. He has come to Wyoming to paint a mural in a post office and he's been commissioned by a man named John Long, who is a wealthy rancher and John has political aspirations. And John and his wife Evie have invited him, they've commissioned him to come in and do this mural and Val is living with them on their ranch. Evie has a background as a bit of a itinerant Drifter. She was a singer. She has not always lived the same kind of life as her husband, and they've only been married a short while. Anyway, he comes into their orbit. He's doing his work, nice, good. And then Evie ups and leaves with John's favorite Renoir painting. He's an art lover, and she just leaves and she takes his favorite little Renoir. And John enlists Val to track down Evie and bring her and the painting back, or at least the painting, I think, is probably more important. Um, but there's no, like, there doesn't feel to be any malice or violence behind it or anything like that. It's like he just wants, he wants them back. And that's kind of as interesting as it got for me. So Val goes to Florida. He, he goes to um, San Francisco. He goes to all these different places tracking her down and, tracking her through these other people she used to know through her past life. And that it just, there was, I just did not like it. I just did not enjoy it. There was animal cruelty in there, which I do not enjoy, even if it's setting up some character development or storyline. I do not like that at all. There was a lot of, it was just a lot of toxic masculinity, you know, like, so this is, we're talking depression era Wyoming. They're on a ranch, there's cowboys. This was not like the fun Yellowstone cowboys. This, these were just like, these were just really toxic guys. I read it because I wanted to get to the end and hear Evie's story. And I just, no, I just, I found that the story didn't go anywhere. I did not enjoy it. And if you liked it, please let me know. I think someone, uh, I, I think I shared in one of my bookish chats recently that I was not enjoying it. And someone said to me that they'd read a few Charles Fraser books and the only one they had liked was Cold Mountain. All the other ones just were real misses for them. So it's interesting, but it was a real miss for me. So nope. But then my month got very, very good. So the next book I read was 84 Charing Cross Road. And I'm not going to do a full rundown on this because I actually did a whole video review on this one. So I'll link that below if you'd like to go watch that later. But this was 84 Charing Cross Road by Helene Hamm. So go check that out after this video. And then the next book I read was Date with Death by Julia Chapman. And I only bought this book because I saw the second book on the shelf and it caught my eye because it was this beautiful, cozy looking winter mystery book. And of course I couldn't start off a series with the second book, so I had to start the first book. So I read this one first. After a really heavy June and I didn't know where I really wanted to start my reading, I felt like I wanted a bit of a cozy mystery, something that even though mysteries are unpredictable, they are very predictable in nature. You know, you know there's a formula that's going to be followed. And this particular one is set in, a, in Yorkshire and there's a lot of quirkiness and the characters. I, I kind of knew what was going to be coming, even though I don't know what the end result of, you know, who the person responsible for all this mayhem is going to be, it gave a bit of a comfort in that sense. So I picked it up for that reason and I really did enjoy it. It was a lot of fun. So Date with Death is what's called the, it's the first of the Dale's Detective series. It is a small town crime and it's full of everyone knowing what everyone else is doing. The opening scene is uh, of a man meeting a very untimely end with a train track. But we get introduced to a number of characters in very quick succession. One of the first characters we meet is Delilah Metcalf. She runs the Dales Dating Agency and is, she is struggling to keep her business afloat financially. She's a divorcee. She has a wayward Waimarama toll puddle, which is the cutest little name. 
Um, but she's trying to keep her business afloat with this dating agency in a very small town and it sounds like a pretty poor business model, but she's persevering with it. And then we meet a, a man named Samson O'Brien who's returning back to uh, this small town, Brunscliff. Uh, he's been dismissed from the police force and he's coming back to his hometown and we realise that he's not welcome. He's not welcome coming back into the town. People are not happy he's back and if you're from a small town, you know that no matter what you do in your life, whatever you did as a kid or a teenager will always define you as an adult in that small town. So while Samson's in town, he fills his time uh, setting up the Dales Detective Agency. And his first case is investigating a supposed suicide that uncovers a trail of deaths that leads straight to Delilah's dating agency. There is so much wit and warmth and the characters are lovely. I really, really love the characters. It is something that I could most definitely see playing out in a TV show. And I'm so looking forward to continuing on with the second book in the series, which is Date with Malice. And I hope to finish that this month. So I highly recommend it. If you're into cozy mysteries and the characters are lovely, I highly recommend it. The next book I read was The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. And oh boy, I think I finally have gotten over my aversion to audiobooks. I always feel like audiobooks are cheating a little bit and that if I'm reading an audiobook, I'm not really reading and I probably shouldn't count an audiobook as a book read for the month. I don't know, it's just a, it's, it's a feeling I have that I shouldn't count it. But... I kind of got to a point this month where I was driving a lot, I was on the road quite a bit and it was kind of cutting into my reading time. So I was, I was doing that and I was also, like I said, I was, I was picking up some knitting in the evening so I was like starting to do a bit of listening in the evening as well instead of watching television because it's hard to knit and watch stuff. So I decided to start listening to an audiobook and I, I tend to listen to the audiobooks that you can listen to for free on Spotify or um, the books that are in the free domain on YouTube because they're free. I'm not paying for a, a service on top of all the other streaming services that are going on. So I started reading this initially and then I picked up on audiobook while I was driving around and I really enjoyed it. And I think this really helped with this particular book because of the dialect. I really find it helpful when you're reading a book that is set at a particular time that has a lot of dialect and accent to listen to the audiobook because it helps you set up that rhythm and cadence. I did it when I read Wuthering Heights, um, A Christmas Carol, these sort of books that um, actually write out the particular accent and dialect. It helps you, I, I, I found it really, really helpful to get into that sort of language. And hearing a professional actor speaking the words as you read it can be really helpful or just listening to it can be really, really beneficial. But it most definitely helps with those ye old English dialects for sure. But the Tom Sawyer ones, it, it was beneficial for. Anyway, I switched between the audio and reading the book of Tom Sawyer. This was originally published in 1876 and it's quite timeless. There's obviously quite a few things happening in here that I hope to God no child ever has to go through but in terms of how a child feels and some of the things that kids go through in terms of coming coming to coming through you know coming to age stories I think it's quite still relevant it really is a coming coming of age story of rebellion friendship adventure and I really did enjoy reading it I don't know how it would feel having read this as a child and coming back to it as an adult I think maybe a lot of that magic would be lost but reading it for the first time as an adult I enjoyed it I had a smile on my face a lot of the time Tom was a really really cheeky boy and I had to laugh uh, at quite a few things like when his aunt clipped him over the ear at one point thinking that he had done something and he was you know saying I didn't do what you just thought I did there was some, someone else did that and she's like oh well I'm sure you did something else today that you deserved a clip over the ear for anyway and she was probably right, but things like that really made me laugh. I was surprised at how dark it got at times with murder, Tom attending his own funeral, a haunted house uh, saving a man from an innocent man from the gallows, and of course uh, the his nemesis, Indian Joe. And I really wonder how it would have felt reading these topics as a child for the first time because they, these are they're, they're quite dark and heavy. 
you know, it's it's interesting. Like, I wonder if kids in 1876 went through this stuff. It's certainly no Anna Green Gables whose most heavy dilemma was, you know, trying to dye her hair raven black and it turns green. It's it's certainly not that. So anyway, I, I really did enjoy it. It was a lot of fun, a lot of adventure. I realise there's a lot of language and attitude in here that are problematic from a 2024 lens and I, I totally get that but I am not someone who thinks that we should edit literature from today's standards whether it's today or you know in the future um, my feelings are that we can't rewrite history and that through reading these things we can do better and we know better that's kind of my feelings on it is that we shouldn't change the past or try and change the past and we read it with the knowledge of today it's kind of my feelings on it but in fact reading a lot of the words in here I would never ever utter some of the words out loud and in fact reading some of the words I would just feel guilty about it I really did enjoy it I enjoyed the story of Tom Sawyer and I'm looking forward to probably picking up Huck Finn and then eventually James by Percival Everett I'm making I'm getting my way there now I thought I was going to be talking about a very different book to end the month off I thought I was going to be talking about Agatha Christie by Lucy Worsley and I was reading it and I kind of I got to this passage I got to this passage while Monty was suffering Agatha was working in the summer of 1926 came her greatest achievement yet her sixth published novel The Murder of Roger Ackroyd is not only one of her very best books, it's one of the greatest detective novels of all time. She invested a lot of care in this book. In it, Poirot moves to an English village to spend a quiet retirement growing vegetable marrows. Instead, he's called upon to solve a fiendishly complex case. A notable character is in the local doctor's sister, Carolyn Shepherd, a sharp spinster who's extremely knowledgeable about village life in a way that foreshadows Miss Marple. It is well known that Roger Ackroyd plays the most remarkable trick on the reader. The story is told by a narrator so unreliable that eventually in a brilliant twist, and I stopped reading right there and I went and picked up the murder of Roger Ackroyd because I was not going to spoil it for myself as to what this enormous twist was for what she was claiming was to be the most incredible detective novel of all time. So I did not finish the Lucy Worsley biography, but I did finish Agatha Christie, uh, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. And I actually just finished it this morning and holy dooly, am I glad I read this before I kept reading this particular sentence because it was a blast. It was so, so good. I've only read a couple of Agatha Christie's books and this is by far the best one I've read. Like I've, I've been making my way through a lot of her short stories, which I've been enjoying. I do like Poirot and the movies I've watched have been Poirot, but I do want to read some Miss Marples because I have heard that Miss Marples, I, I feel like based on what I've read that maybe Miss Marple might be more my speed. Anyway, the Roger Ackroyd story was really quite cool. And I'm glad I read it without any spoilers and I'm not going to give any spoilers here so you can rest easy. So The, the Murder of Roger Ackroyd was published in 1926 and I think it was the third or fourth Poirot book. And our, our narrator is James Shepherd. He is a doctor in a small town and we open to the death of a woman in this particular town. And we follow James as he finds out along with the rest of the town that Mrs Ferris has uh, apparently killed herself in a drug overdose. Just one year after her own husband has died in a, his own suspicious death, James is then called to another man's house, Roger Ackroyd, and Roger confides in James that um, Mrs. Ferris is, he, he loves Mrs. Ferris, or loved Mrs. Ferris, they were going to marry, and Mrs. Ferris had confided in him that she was being blackmailed, um, that someone knew that she, did in fact kill her first husband and that she was being blackmailed and that she was going to tell Roger who was blackmailing her. And so this is what James has been, James is narrating this whole story. But before Roger could find out who was blackmailing Mrs. Ferris, he is also stabbed to death. Fortunately for Roger, Hercule Poirot, our favourite Belgian detective, has moved into this quiet little village to, um, I think he's, ret he's retired, to grow marrows and he, has, he is now undertaking the investigation to find out who has done this horrible crime. It was really so, so good. I read the first quarter of the book, I actually read it, and then the remainder of the book I listened to on audio while I was doing some knitting in the evenings. 
And the audio book I listened to was actually on YouTube and it was narrated by Hugh Fraser and it was really well, well done. So I'll, I'll link to the playlist below if you wanted to listen to it. It's very well done and perfectly atmospheric for a winter, a rainy winter's night, which is what we had in the last week here. The book will have you gasping at the end as, you, as, as everything is revealed in the typical Christie way. But it, it's so, so good. I really did enjoy it. It's, it's a great book. And I, I think it's interesting that Agatha Christie, from what I've been reading in the, the Lucy Walsley biography, is that Agatha Christie did write some plays. And I really do think that a lot of her stories lend themselves to that dramatization of, you know, like someone really um, emphasizing certain things and hearing someone else articulate something in real life. So there is something to hearing it. So um, watching the movie or hearing an audio book, I think that they maybe should be listened to in that way sometimes. But anyway, now I can pick up the biography and keep going. Now I've read that book. I hope there's not going to be another one like that because otherwise this book is going to take me forever to go through. I've only read, I want to say three, it's probably only three books of Agatha Christie's, including Roger Ackroyd that I've read. Anyway, so that was my month in books. I hope you enjoyed this little tete a tete and it was a good month despite the start with the trackers which i'm going to be throwing out as soon as i finish this video um if you have different opinions about the trackers i would love to hear them because maybe i just missed the point entirely i just did not get it but let's not talk about that i'm going to finish on a high um, i'm going to leave a link here to the charing cross road video if you would like to go watch that to see a full in-depth review on that particular book it was marvelous and I hope to see you soon. Like I said, there's only four weeks left of winter. So very soon I'll be sharing with you my spring TBR. And I'm excited to share with you some books I've got coming up on that one. And I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. But again, thank you for joining me here. I hope you have a wonderful weekend ahead. And I'll see you again next time. Bye.